So hopefully everyone can um, see my slides now, so it should be an enriched uh, chemistry experience using multiple languages. So I guess um, what I want to talk about today is sort of my experience of using languages in science, which obviously is what we've been focusing on today. So a very sort of personal perspective of, of where I've been during my career, basically. Um, so um, this is sort of a, a Lego picture of my lab. So I work in chemistry. Um, so I spend most of my time, or at least when I was uh, research active, um, in, in a lab. So very much uh, working at a fume hood, um, like we've got uh, pictured here. Um, so I guess this is a sort of picture of my lab. Um, I'm at the back here and I have my PhD students and my postdocs working with me um, in this lab. OK, so um, I thought I'd go back to um, Uh, so I thought I'd start off by um, perhaps where I first got interested in languages and I guess um, it was when I was quite young and we started going on holidays to France. So I guess it wasn't really the language to start with that really uh, interested me. It was um, it was what I saw when I went to France, which was completely different to what we had in the southwest of England where I grew up. So. Firstly, going on a boat was amazing. We didn't have anything like that at home. And the second thing that really jumped out when, when you're about six is the hypermarket in France, because we'd never seen anything like that um, back in my small village. You know, you go into this uh, sort of supermarket at home and it wasn't very big. And then you go to France and you have this hypermarket, which is massive, um, and you could buy all these things, and particularly the stationary aisle, which is the one um, that, that really inspired me. So in particular, these pens that I've shown on the bottom right of the screen, were really, really in demand at my school. So uh, there's this eraser pen here. You couldn't buy that in England. So mm -hmm. that was really, really exciting when you're about eight, 10, whatever. Um, the other thing that we were really excited about, me and my brother at the time, was these sweets called Pez. I guess anyone who's about my age, about 40, might recognize those if you'd been in France at the time or other countries probably. Also weren't available in England at the time. So you had this dispenser on the on the left hand side where you loaded your pez in um, and you could eat those those sweets out of the dispenser. Obviously a complete waste of plastic, but whatever. At the time when you're six or eight uh, is really exciting. So I guess it wasn't really the language that um, that sort of attracted me to start with. But then once we got into school and started learning about languages, that's where I really realised that, that languages were, were going to be really important for me. So at my school, we had the option of studying French and German. So I did take both of those. I started French in year seven, um, so the first year of secondary school, and then picked up German in year eight. So I carried on both of those languages to uh, GCSEs. And I think throughout all of my school career, um, I considered that languages would be what I would do um, for the rest of my life. So that was what I was good at. Um, not to say that I wasn't good at anything else. I, I was. I was a good student overall, but, but language was something that I perhaps stood out in. Um, I was also very, very privileged that I was able to go on exchanges to both France and Germany as a, as a younger pupil. Um, so probably around the age of 13, 14, I went twice to sully sur loire in uh, France, which, as you can see, is just a little bit south of Paris. Um, and I also went twice to Norden in Germany, which is right on the north coast, um, so quite close to the island of Norderney. So I was really lucky to get those experiences. I went to the same family uh, for both trips in France and both trips in Germany. Um, and so I was able to go back to the same place twice, um, a farm it was in, in France, and then a, a sort of normal house, I guess, in Germany, uh, where I got to meet um, lots of different people and, and see how French people and the German people, at least in those families, lived um, and how that was different to, to my own experiences at home. So I also became quite interested in Japanese at the age of around 12 or 13, something like that. Um, and I did have a Japanese pen friend at the time. I couldn't speak any Japanese because we didn't really have any opportunity to learn it through school. And I guess living in a smallish village, there wasn't really the opportunity to learn Japanese like I guess might be easier nowadays online. But back then, um, online wasn't really um, something that you would even have considered. So I then um, sort of naturally went on to A-levels. Uh, I started in French, German and biology, which is perhaps a slightly weird combination. I don't think anyone really thought much of it because we were expecting them to go on with, with languages. So French and German would easily let me go to university uh, to study um, French or German or other languages as well. 
I guess what um, most people didn't realise is that I actually had been quite interested in biology and I'd actually been thinking about going to university to do biology, uh, which a combination of three A-levels in French, German and biology probably wouldn't have been a fantastic choice, actually. Um, what I realised quickly was that I didn't like biology. What I actually liked was chemistry. And so I guess two weeks into my A-levels, I changed to do chemistry. And that's actually what I ended up doing later on. So really glad that I did make that decision then. So I ended up doing um, then French chemistry uh, and biology for A-levels. Had to drop German, unfortunately, because the timetabling didn't work out to do French and German and biology and chemistry. You had to drop one of those. And so unfortunately, German as my slightly less preferred language over French and German um, had to go at that point, unfortunately. And I guess uh, that goes back to what Richard was saying very early today about, you know, having to sort of make this choice between science and, and languages, um, you know, quite early on, really, at age 16, it's quite early to be making that decision. I did, in the end, make the decision for science rather than languages, but you can see it was quite a close run thing. It could have gone either way. Um, I'm glad I did make the decision to do science in the end because I was actually able to carry on my languages as well. But that was when I first really became aware of that sort of pressure that you had to choose one or the other and doing both wasn't really um, considered a possibility. And I have to say that my language teachers were very supportive of me. My science teachers were less so. Um, they thought that I probably wouldn't be able to do chemistry and languages and it might impact on my ability in science if I was trying to do languages as well. So it really was the pressure, I would say, from more the scientific side than the languages side. OK. Um, so I knew at that point I wanted to go abroad for a year. I was aware of the possibility of doing a degree where you could go abroad. And so I only applied to chemistry courses where I could go abroad. So I was pretty set on going to France. Um, and so quite a lot of universities at the time had the possibility to do that. And I guess there were two variants that you could choose. You could um, study chemistry and go abroad for a year or you could study chemistry and French. And I guess the subtle difference there was that uh, if you were studying chemistry and French, you would probably need to be studying some literature in that French component. And I'd identified that in A-levels as something that I absolutely hated. So I really struggled with the literature component of A-level. I think I got an E grade in that part of the module and then A's and <laughs> literally everything else. Um, and so I'd already identified really that um, studying languages at university probably wouldn't have been a great choice for me because actually I, I think it would have been difficult for me to avoid completely doing doing literature. I liked learning languages but I really didn't like literature and I guess it's not a huge surprise I hated English literature as well why would I like it in a different language it's the same sort of thing right um, so, so I'm glad I made the right choice to study science but, but add the, uh, the language almost as an aside. And I guess that was really easy to do at York um, because they have this languages for all program where most of the language courses run in the evening. So it meant that you never had any clashes between your chemistry and your languages. Of course, you had to be available in the evening. Um, but in the first year, uh, there was a slot on a Monday morning that was specially uh, set aside. No one could timetable any chemistry then because that was the language slot for those people who were taking a language. So that works um, really, really well. So I did three years in New York um, studying chemistry. So that was lectures and workshops and labs. Um, and then on a Thursday evening, it normally was, I had a, an evening course in French. So that was normally two hours um, after an A-level. So a relatively um, advanced course where we were thinking about, you know, discussions, advanced topics, things like that. And that prepared me really well for my year abroad, uh, which is in the fourth year of my degree, where I went to um, the University of Joseph Fourier in uh, Grenoble. And I have to say, I also picked up Japanese at this time. That was something I'd wanted to do for a long time. And so because those languages for all courses were so convenient, I did pick up two years of Japanese in my first three years of, um, of my degree. So you can see the picture of, um, of Grenoble, the, uh, the campus universitaire with the mountains in the background. Um, really, really nice place to study. Um, very, very different to my experience in, in the north of England at the University of York. So. After those three years at York, I moved on uh, to, um, to France for my final year. And 
it was quite different. And I guess that was to be expected. We didn't at that time get a lot of preparation of how it was going to be when we went abroad. We just got sent off and, and that was sort of fine. Um, it's quite different, I think, to nowadays when I've been the study abroad advisor in, in the chemistry department here. We've, we've really had to think very carefully about how things are done and matching modules and things like that. I didn't get the impression that that was how it worked back then. It was just sort of you, you go there and you, you talk to somebody and you, you sort everything out once you get there, basically. But it was actually fine. Um, I would say um, the teaching style was very different to the UK. And I guess that's not necessarily um, all teachers um, in, in all places. Um, the specific teachers I had on the courses were quite interesting, actually. There was one lecturer who dictated all of his lectures, literally from, you know, um, new paragraph full stop new paragraph he used to draw some structures on the board but um that, that was how he gave his lectures and that was very new to me um and it, it turned out very new to everyone else as well actually <laughs> so if this wasn't a french thing at all uh, this was just this, this particular professor um and so, so that was very interesting and you would have thought might have been quite challenging um having to do essentially a dictation in a, in a foreign language in a in learning new chemistry but actually, I would say that the chemistry in French was absolutely fine. Um, a lot of people perhaps find that surprising, that um, learning new chemistry in a new language would be the most challenging aspect of being abroad. But it actually wasn't. I would say that was the easiest part of being abroad. Most of the words are similar or you can guess them or from the context, you, you can work out what, what is meant. So I actually found that the studying chemistry in French was really no more difficult than studying um, chemistry in English, actually. What was a bit of a shock was the oral exams, I would say. Um, we didn't have any of those at, at the University of York. And um, so when I came to France and found out that at the end of each course, there was going to be this oral exam with a, with a professor on our own in his office, uh, that, that was a little bit worrying. <laughs> so um, those, those were OK, though, actually. I mean, I did get through them. And actually, one of them worked out very well for me uh, because I was asked a question. I had a, a molecule drawn on the board. And the professor had highlighted three hydrogen atoms on a specific molecule. We don't need to go into details here, obviously, with the chemistry. But the question was, which of these hydrogen atoms is going to react most quickly? And I had absolutely no idea. And I thought, what am I going to do? <laughs> I've got to say something. Um, so I thought, I don't know. I know it's definitely not this one. So perhaps I'll say that. Um, perhaps that will get me started. So in my slight nervousness, I aim to say, I know it's not that one. But what I actually said was, it's not that one. And uh, so it actually came out as a question rather than a statement. And um, that was the one that he wanted. But, but what he understood, I said, was, is it that one from the intonation that I'd accidentally sort of introduced? And so I actually did very well there because he said, that's a brilliant answer. If you can tell me why, then you will get really, really good mark. And so, of course, having just reasoned that it wasn't that one, <laughs> it's a little bit of an internal panic, having to sort of try and keep a straight face. Uh, but in that 10 seconds, I did realise what the answer was, actually, having been given the information that that was the correct answer. And so I did get a very good mark there. And so although the oral exams were, were odd, were a total shock, um, at least one of those did go really very well for me, actually, much better than uh, a written exam would have gone in that that particular scenario. So that was sort of half of my year abroad was the talk course and then I had half of the year on a research project as well. So this was my first experience really in um, a project setting in a lab. We'd had three years of teaching laboratories in, um, in the University of York so I was familiar with how you do operations in a lab but not how you would plan them and how you would integrate that into a project environment. So the great thing here was that I had a choice of the research project. So I arrived, um, I saw the Erasmus coordinator on the first day that I was there. She said, what sort of project would you like to do? I said, oh, I don't know what, what's available, what are the options? And she said, what, what would you really like to do? If you could have any project, what would it be? And so I said, oh, I, I'd really like to do this, this one area. It doesn't matter what it is particularly. Um, and she took me straight up to the lab and she said, right, that's, that's the lab on the third floor. We'll take you there now. We'll talk to the director. And so I got the choice of project that I wanted. So that was absolutely perfect. And I'm sure um, I got much more choice than I would have got had I stayed in, in the UK for that project. So I was integrated into a research group there. I was with a, um, a researcher who was quite new to the university at the time. He'd only been there two years. Um, so that was a really, really um, great experience for me because I learned all of my project, um, sort of how you how you do research in France, really. Um, 
it was also where I learned a lot about French culture and colloquialisms, things like that, because um, when you're doing a research project, of course, you're embedded within a research team. You're talking to people next to you, not just about the chemistry you're doing, but what you're doing at the weekend, um, what they might be doing, things like that. And one thing that I, I just remember from the first few weeks is it's the expression, uh, c'est nickel. Um, which has two meanings. And um, for three weeks, I had no idea what my boss was saying when he kept saying to me, c'est nickel. What he meant was my results were great. <laughs> but nickel is a metal, uh, as you can see from the second drawing here. It's part of the periodic table. So I could not, for the life of me, understand why he was telling me that this was nickel, because it wasn't. <laughs> we hadn't used any nickel. It had nothing to do with nickel. And I think it, it did take him three weeks to realise why I was always a bit confused. And I wish I'd actually just asked him, um, because then he realised and said, oh, you know, it's because nickel is a shiny metal, so it's nice. And so, the, so we use that to say, oh, it's great. Um, so, so I just remember that from, from the first few weeks and, you know, similar examples when I've had students come here as well, where similar misunderstandings just because of colloquialisms, basically. So I guess that the project allowed me um, to really get involved with, with a lot of French people. We tended to have lunch together in the university canteens, something that doesn't happen a great deal in the UK, I would say, uh, or at least in my experience. I could go skiing at the weekend. Um, I took trampolining classes as well. That was something I'd done at York as well previously. And there was a really vibrant Erasmus community as well. So not just French people that I met, but people from right around the world um, where French was our common language. Um, so that was really, really, really um, far and away the best year of university for me. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so after that experience, I came back to do my PhD at the University of York. Uh, so again, focusing on chemistry, particular um, organic chemistry as, as my specialism. And one thing that I really hadn't um, thought about was the concept of reverse homesickness, because I hadn't heard of that as a concept before. And I'd never been homesick um, the whole year that I was in France. It just never happened. I really enjoyed my year. It was fantastic. Easily the best year of university, as I've said. Um, it was a bit of a culture shock coming back to the UK, actually. Um, I found that I was suddenly quite critical of the way the UK did a lot of things compared to what I'd seen in France. Um, I had realised some of my privilege, perhaps, and that not everybody had the same opportunities in the UK. Um, and that, that some things, at least in France, were organised differently, such that um, you, you didn't see that um, in quite the same way. And it was also um, the first time I'd really experienced UK research culture, because previously I'd been a, an undergraduate student, so I'd not really been in the research labs very much. And one thing I'll say about my, my research area, so organic chemistry, is that, at least historically, it's been very, very male-dominated. And that wasn't the case so much in France. Um, so I, I hadn't noticed this in France particularly, but I did notice it very much when I came back uh, that I was one of two women on the floor. Um, so there must have been 30, 40 um, people on that floor. And, and at points in my PhD, there were only two women. So certainly organic chemistry does have a bit of a problem with uh, representation of women. That is getting better nowadays. But, but back then, um, wasn't something that I had um, come up or really thought about. And I think it was um, sort of that sort of thing that made me feel a little bit isolated in my first year of my PhD. Um, not because anybody particularly isolated me or anything like that, but I think uh, representation is important. It's not something that I'd come across before, but because I'd had a totally different experience in France where um, representation was a lot more diverse, actually, in, in the organic chemistry labs, it really was a huge change to come back to the UK. Nevertheless, I really enjoyed doing research. I, want, I really enjoyed working independently um, and my interest in organic chemistry really, really grew. So I knew that I wanted to continue in that area. I was also very lucky to go abroad for three months to, to work at Hoffman La Roche in uh, Switzerland. And this was a complete accident. Uh, very lucky to have the opportunity. There was a PhD student the year above me who was actually funded by Roche. Um, he really didn't want to go abroad. Um, so when the opportunity came, um, normally you can spend three months uh, abroad if you're, if you're sponsored by um, one of the pharmaceutical companies when you're doing a PhD. Um, he really didn't want to go. And I just remember quite offhand saying to my boss, um, oh, it's such a shame because, you know, John doesn't want to go. And, you know, if it was me, I'd jump at the chance. And uh, so anyway, my boss managed to somehow turn it around so that I could go instead of John. So both people were happy because John didn't want to go. I did want to go. Um, so I spent three months at Roche. Um, 
actually is a sabbatical in the end, so it wasn't part of my PhD, uh, but I spent time working on medicinal chemistry uh, within the industry environment. So I got a really good insight into what it would be like to, to do organic chemistry in industry. I decided it probably wasn't for me, um, just the sort of um, the way industry projects are driven means that, you know, um, if it's the project isn't going well, you might have to drop it, you know, one week to the next. And I wasn't sure whether that was really for me. I like to focus on something and really make it work. Um, so that was a really useful time in my PhD because I think it sort of led me more towards academia than um, an industry job. And of course, living in Switzerland, you could travel around France, Germany, Switzerland at weekends. Uh, it was a fantastic opportunity. But I did have a bit itchy feet after four years back in the UK, so I thought, OK, perhaps I go abroad again. And so I did. So I started some postdoctoral research, um, which I went to Paris for. And um, here uh, I spent one year in Paris Sud, so uh, just south of Paris, uh, where I had complete immersion essentially into um, the French um, speaking lab. So it wasn't a particularly international lab there. Most people did speak French all day. Um, and so um, I was really thinking in French there and I really got my, my level of French up, I think, that year more so even than I had in my Erasmus year. So I really enjoyed doing the research. Again, I had a lot of independence. Um, I could do what I liked, uh, but I wasn't very successful publication wise, which was a bit of a shame. I then went back to the UK for three years and essentially had the same thing um, in that I really enjoyed it. But when it comes to looking for an academic position, you need uh, quite a long list of publications and I just didn't have them, unfortunately. So I decided to go abroad again. And this time I went for a Humboldt Fellowship. Um, and so I went to Germany uh, for what turned out to be almost three years in the end. And I'll just uh, highlight the Alexander von Humboldt Fellowship as a fantastic opportunity. If anyone is uh, supervising any people that might want to go for this, please do push them towards it uh, because it's uh, the, the advantages are huge. You get a German course all for free. So I spent two months learning German. Um, I did have a background in German, but I had brought my level up through this fellowship decided to take the B2 exam um, after two years in Munich, which I passed, um, and you get a generous stipend for, for your research as well. Again, it was a different culture, quite different to my experiences in the UK and France. Um, I was learning a slightly um, new variation of organic chemistry, so organic photochemistry this time, using light to do chemistry. And I was also teaching that new subject as well, so it was quite a steep learning curve. I was learning it pretty much one or two weeks before I then had to teach it to the master's class. So that made you learn things quite quickly, I would say. Um, I decided to carry on with that in my independent research. Um, and um, uh, yeah, I'll just move the slide here. Um, and so I guess just to highlight um, my experience in France, Germany and the UK has meant that I've now got various different vocabularies for the same thing, which can lead to some confusion. Um, so the one on the left is a piece of glassware uh, that in England we call a swan neck. I guess it's sort of the shape of a swan neck, but the French will call it um, a duck beak instead. So when I first came back to the UK, I only knew um, that the French word for it. So I was asking people for the duck adapter and people <laughs> just didn't have no idea what I was talking about, of course. Same uh, with a, a distillation adapter that we got on the right. It's called a pig in England, but it's called a spider in, in German. And again, you can sort of see how people get to those descriptions, but it's quite a different approach in, in the different languages. OK, so organic chemistry is the other approach that I speak. And so I won't go into any detail here, don't worry. Um, but you can see that we use these depictions of molecules, basically. Uh, we've got carbon and hydrogen atoms, and we draw the carbons. Every bend is basically a carbon atom. And so I guess you can think of it as a little bit similar to sort of Chinese or Japanese kanji characters. You know, these are representations of a, a three-dimensional object that we have to represent somehow uh, 2D on paper. So of course, they're not we have contributions from many, many countries. You can see uh, named reactions are a big thing in organic chemistry. The names you can see here come from a variety of different countries, but France, Germany, Russia, uh, China, Japan um, contributed a lot in these sorts of areas. And so I guess just to finish off, my area now of focus is um, organic photochemistry. So this is using light to drive organic chemistry. And so um, the H mu here um, across the arrow just shows, uh, just means light. And so you can take these starting materials, 
zap them with a bit of light and stick them together essentially or rearrange them completely. So you don't need to know the details there, of course, but uh, this is what I focus on um, now. And I would say as a PI, uh, so principal investigator in my lab, I've been greatly influenced by my previous experiences in different international environments. And so how I run my group, I think I've taken what I consider the best from, from where I've worked before um, to, to uh, sort of how I run my group. Much the you know, last one. Um, so, in terms of um, keeping my languages alive, I do uh, have quite a lot of connections in France. So, I'm an occasional PhD examiner. Um, I do attend the smaller conferences in France as well. Um, so, the GECO meetings every other year generally I mean, nice um, destinations by the sea, normally, as you can see here. Um, much of speaking next week in France, fingers crossed I'm allowed to go with COVID restrictions, but at the moment um, I am. Um, and I also have many visiting students come to my research through, uh, group through the Erasmus scheme, or at least I did. Uh, we'll see how that works out with Erasmus in the future. OK, I think I'll leave it there because I'm out of time, so I have got another slide, but don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Susanna, for sharing your experiences and a lot of what you say uh, I can relate to you know, from my own experiences as an, as an academic in different countries. Um, do we have a, uh, any questions? Anyone in the chat? Well, um, in that case, I'll um, ask a question. You, you talked about at the end about how your experiences in other countries have influenced how you run your group as a principal investigator. Yeah. Could you tell us more about that? Uh, yeah, OK. Um, so I guess what generally I found, and obviously this doesn't apply to every lab in, in specific countries, but I found that in France there was a lot more sort of team working and collaboration. Um, when I worked in Germany, I found that sort of PhD students, postdocs were expected to be a lot more independent. Yes. Um, so I sort of try to take that into account, I guess, in my group. I yeah. offer support where I think somebody might want it, but I try to cover all bases, I guess. I try not to just come from one angle, um, is I guess what I'm saying, because I've really experienced um, you know, in France, when I was when I was younger, it was great to have a little bit more support. I think that the expectations mm -hmm. were perhaps not quite so high on what you were expected to do mm -hmm. independently. When I went to Germany, I could see that as a master's student, really, you were expected to go in the lab and get on with it. Um, I would have found that very difficult, I have to say, as a, as a new PhD student or a master's student uh, to be able to do that. But of course, the training background was different. Um, yes. So, so uh, that, that's fair enough. Yes, um, yes. But, yes, it's great that you mentioned 